Hey, hey, hey. Good to be here this morning. Thanks for everyone. Yeah, get those Easter cards out. I find these sometimes on the ground, and I'm like, I better get them so I can pass them out, because otherwise they're just, you know, going to waste. And we want as many people to know uh, what's going on. If you're like me, and you haven't turned in your Kingdom Builders cards, even though we've told you multiple times, uh, I got it right here. I have it. I have it. I'm putting it in the back. I put it in my Bible this morning. I was like, I got to get that in there. Um, but this is due today, like you just heard Pastor Tom said, in two weeks, we are starting a new talk series called Essentials. Uh, we're going to be d- diving deep into the book of Ephesians. And if you think that the book of Ephesians, this book that was written, you know, a couple thousand years ago, <laughs> doesn't relate to you, uh, you'd be wrong. Because they talk about everything from marriage and relationships to, uh, to, to unity, to division, to things that we see on a regular basis, day in and day out in our lives here. And so it's going to be amazing as we walk through that, that book. But I think what's going to be so impactful for you as we walk through this series is something that you can not only invite your friends and family back to Easter next week, but can invite them the week after to Essentials, is because this is going to help us create healthy rhythms in our life, spiritual rhythms, things that we just kind of need to put into our life again. Uh, Sometimes uh, when we go walk through difficult seasons and the pandemic being one of those seasons, sometimes our rhythms get a little out of whack. And we're going to kind of put them into proper perspective, uh, uh, again, from a biblical perspective, walking through uh, Ephesians together. So I'm excited about that. That's in two weeks. But like um, Brooke and Pastor Tom said, Easter next week is going to be awesome. I'm so excited uh, for that. We have those two services, and this is going to be it's going to be fantastic. Today we are we are concluding our series on kingdom builders. We've been talking about it for the last several weeks. We we uh, this is uh, week five actually of kingdom builders, and so uh, we're excited to conclude this series. But we just a quick recap. Week one we talked about going from defense to offense. How important it is to, go, to, sh- to make that shift sometimes in our life when we feel like everything's coming against us, but quickly we have to make a shift to kind of go uh, uh, on the offense. We talked about in week two having the courage sometimes that we need to have to clean house. We need, we need to have courage sometimes to actually remove some things out of our lives that we've just kind of slipped past our guard. And, uh, and we need to do that. And in week three, um, we had an incredible message on process over product. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was just awesome to see that God is a God of process. We like to be, live in a world of production, but God is a God of process. And sometimes he takes us on a process that doesn't make sense to us, but is part of the dream that he has, the plan that God has. And sometimes we just need to, to understand that sometimes it's a process more than a product. Last week was a difficult message because it was a message called Unhappy Endings. It was a, it was a message, it was a cautionary tale of what happened in Gideon's life after he achieved great victory. And sometimes when we achieve some, accomplish some things or achieve some things, sometimes if we're not careful, we can let some things kind of seep in. We talked about the, the concept of turning altars into idols. And while that not, may not just on the surface apply, you know, feel like, well, how does that really work, relate? Uh, it relates. Uh, and so I would encourage you to go back and check that out if you missed that last week. Today is the final installment of Kingdom Builders. And we're going to talk about God-sized vision today. God-sized vision. I don't know about you, but I know that I want a God-sized vision for my life. I want a God-sized vision for my life. I don't want a Jason-sized vision because if I have a Jason-sized vision, it feels accomplishable. Is that a word? To me, right? Like we put that into our, like our framework, our mindset, our kind of box, if you will, and say, okay, I have a vision for my life. I think I have an aspiration of where I want to go, and I think it's possibly achievable. And so I'm like, okay, that, this, is, this is possibly achievable, so I want to go in this direction. But what I want is I want a God-sized vision and lean into that because I know with God, nothing is impossible, right? With God, all things are possible, all things are achievable, and I know that he can do above and beyond all that we ask or imagine, Right? And so we know that if we dig into a God-sized vision, that there's going to be something incredible that we can be part of. Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter, all the things that we are looking at, celebrating, remembering this week, leading up to next Sunday, they are all, part, they're all moments that are part of a much bigger God-sized vision. And part, that's, you're part of this whole story. 
Because the kingdom of God, the kingdom builders, is more than a moment. It's a movement. It's more than just a, a single point in history. It's part of a big, larger vision, a big, larger story. All of those things are part of a God-sized vision to, re- to redeem mankind and to bring us into right relationship with him. And we are called to be part of this movement. You and me and all of us in Faith Journey and the churches around and everybody part of the kingdom of God, we're all called to be part of this movement, not this moment isolated, but it's part of this greater God-sized vision. Everything that we do, everything that we do as a church is helping people navigate life, navigate life through faith in Jesus. Everything we do is reaching those disconnected from God. And so we, you know, as we step into that calling or have stepped into that calling, it's important that we do the right thing. But it's also important that we do the right thing for the right reasons. A lot of churches can harp on behaviors and get people to respond and do what is right and not to do wrong things. And that's, that's good. But I think it's important for us to understand that we need to do right things for the right reasons and what the right reasons are. Right? And I'm going to talk a little bit before we get into the passage today about one of those things that help us shape what those right reasons are. And it has to do with this concept, and this may be a trigger for you, but it has to do with your attitude towards law. Your attitude towards law. You probably have feelings about law or about the law. It may be good. It may be good feelings that you have. You know, it makes you safe. It makes you secure. We all want some law. No one wants to live in a lawless place because it'd be dangerous, right? We, want, we, we like some level of security and safety in our lives. Maybe you love the law, or maybe the law for you is fear and frustration because you're like, who's making the law? Do I trust the people making the law? Do I trust lawmakers? Do I trust law enforcers? I don't know. And so there's some skepticism that kind of goes along. That Depending on, your, on the law, though, your emotions about the law, your obedience to the law, your ability to do the right things for the right reasons, it's going to depend on who made the law and why. And I know this, you want law, and you know you need law because you've enforced some laws in your day. Anybody who has any responsibility ever of a kid, you have enforced some laws in your day, right? A grandparent, a parent, mom and dad, aunt and uncle, teacher, babysitter, you name it. If you had some sort of responsibility over a child in your life, you had to enforce some laws. You had to enforce some boundaries, some rules, some whatever. And depending on on the law and your emotions about it and who made it, it really depends on who made the law and why. For instance, when I was growing up, Sometimes, occasionally, I would get in trouble. Very rarely, very rarely, very rarely. But occasionally I would, and my mom would say, Jason, go to your room and don't come out until I say so. I don't know if you did. I am in a unique age bracket. I'm just going to pause right there. Where those of you, I I relate to those of you who are like, you know what, I know what it's like to to have that in my life. Because I grew up in a a time, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have computers, Right? We had, computer, we had a computer lab, if you're lucky, you know. We didn't, I didn't have cell phones. It's not like I could go up and play video games, you know. And like, so some of you are old enough, you're like, you know, that meant something. Like, you go up in your room, you stay there until I get it. Some of you are like, man, I go up in my room, I can play video games. I got my TV in my room. I can get on the computer. I can get on my cell phone, chat with my friends. Like, parenting today is a little bit, you know, you have to take some things in consideration. So I'm like in that, per- where my mom is like, go to your room, shut the door, don't come out until I say so. So I come up and get you. And I just had to go basically up to my room and sit on my bed. You know, just kind of. And so she could, she could do that. And I, my question is, is that a good law? And most of you are probably asking, well, what did you do? Right? <laughs> Depends on what you did. Is that a good law? And I know that's kind of like a, 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 a tamed down example. But she could be saying that for a lot of different reasons. It could be coming from a lot of different places. My mom could have made that rule for a variety of reasons. It could have been self-serving. It could have been self-serving for her, right? She wants to keep me bottled up, or she she doesn't want me to grow up, or she doesn't want me to experience life, uh, you know, or she she wanted to kind of keep me away from from girls. I don't know, right? She wanted me in the form that she, it could be self-serving for her, that she's like, I want to protect you. I want to guard you. You're not allowed to do these things or experience these things. Go up and do this. It could be self-serving. It could be 
something that just was kind of going on in her, her, in her mind. It could be emotional or it could be just kind of something wrong. It could be almost like, uh, it could almost even to, and this wasn't her, but it could, there would be, could be a reason where somebody was like, they're just sick and they're like trying to cage you, right? She'd be like, I'm, you're not experiencing anything. Go up there, do it now. Don't come up until I, don't you know, come out and talk because you're basically imprisoning you into your room. People do this. My mom didn't do it, but people do it. It could be a reason. It could have been, and this is probably the case, punitive, right? I did something bad. That's kind of where my news tends to go, usually goes. I broke a rule. There's punishment for a season. Or it could be out of protection, right? There's an intruder in the house. There's a threat of some sort. And she says, go up to your room, shut the door, lock the door. Don't come out until I come and get you and tell you. There, it could be for a variety of reasons. Most of the time, all the time, it was punitive for me. But my attitude to the law is completely based on my belief about the lawmaker. My attitude towards my mom telling me that was completely based off of my relationship or my attitude towards the person giving me the rule or the law. If I believe that my mom loves me, if I believe that my mom loved me more than she loves herself, she's willing to sacrifice for me, wants the best for my life, my mom's not self-serving, she's not sick in the head, it's not that she can't wait to punish me, my mom loves me and is creating security for me, and when she says, go to your room, shut the door, and don't come out until I say so, I can immediately trust and will do what she told me to do. I'll do the right thing and do it for the right reason because I know she loves me and she wants the best for me. Not that I agree with it or I'm happy about it, but I can understand it. Now, all this has tremendous application to the laws and the rules as it relates to God because people have a variety of beliefs about God and about how God interacts with you. And so some think, well, God made laws and rules based on he just wants to punish me. It's punitive. He can't wait to punish me. He's just sitting, waiting for me to do something wrong so he can be like, gotcha, hoping I break a rule so he can lock me up in my room. Some think, you know, God must just be sick and that he's unjust. He's unjust. Why would he do this? Why would he make this rule? It's just not fair. It's just not just. And so I'm not going to do it. Some may think God's trying to contain me. He doesn't want me to experience all of life. He's trying to keep me from experiences. He's trying to keep good things from me. And yet, when it comes to people who have actually have proximity and relationship with God, and it's been proven to them that he actually loves them, they see the laws and the rules completely different. And we see this dynamic going on immediately in Judges chapter 6. Throughout this whole series, we've been looking at, the, in the book of Judges 6, 7, and 8, through the life of Gideon. We started with Judges chapter 6, and we see this at play immediately in Judges chapter 6. When the angel appears to Gideon and starts telling, me, telling him, hey, God wants you to do that. You're a mighty hero. You're a mighty warrior. God's going to deliver you. We, I know you've been in seven years in captivity and you're kind of getting your teeth kicked in. Gideon turns around immediately and says in verse, t for verse 13, but the Lord has abandoned us. He's an absentee father. He's not there. If he loved us so much, why would he let these things happen to us? Why would we have to go through seven years of oppression? If he was such a good dad, why did he leave me in this situation? Gideon's lack of desire to follow and obey and walk by faith was directly related to his feelings of abandonment by God. And that's why we can get really excited about some of these big holidays. We get really excited about Christmas. Because Christmas is a celebration of Jesus, who is the personification of God in human form. God with us, God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. Paul says it this way in the book of Colossians chapter 1, that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He's there. He's there. We, we see it. We know he was there. And if I've been given rules and regulations from an entity that I don't have any proximity with to, I'm going to have it be hard to trust especially if I have any shred of evidence that that entity is annoyed with me, wants to hurt me, oppress me, I will naturally rebel because there is no relationship. And that is what's so beautiful about Jesus is that Jesus turns the whole thing from religion into relationship. He turns from institution to ecosystem. 
He says, we're going to flip this a little bit. God not only loves you, God is now with you. He's with us. And if we approach God, the Bible, church as an institution or as a religion instead of relationship in an ecosystem, then we have this weird kind of strained, distant relationship and it will not bring out what is natural. So when you think of ecosystem, you kind of set up that what you do, uh, you know, uh, what you do produces certain results. Certain behaviors that produce certain results. I'll take a seed, I plant it in the soil. If the soil is fertile, if it gets plenty of water and sunlight, then it's going to grow. And if I keep weeds off the plant, it's going to grow. It'll do what it's naturally created to do. And the ecosystem of relationships is if I have the proper input, if I have love in my relationships, if we have a healthy conflict and we have healthy communication, we're sacrificial, we do all that stuff, the relationship will bud and it will grow and develop. If I keep the weeds out of my relationship, I keep some of the bad things out, it's going to continue to grow. It's an ecosystem. And when Jesus did, what, when, what Jesus did when he came to earth was he took this institution, this idea of this religion, uh, 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 and, and made it sure it became something that was more relationship, something that was more relational. It was an ecosystem. He was God with us. Now, all the principles and all the rules have a personality and a face and an attitude and a behavior. So we read things like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see the personality of Jesus. We see God in human form, fully God and fully man. And this is the most amazing part. When Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit, so it's not just a history lesson about what God may have been like, but now I have a personal experience with God in my heart. It transforms my beliefs and my values. It transforms the way I think. It transforms my desires and my, my relation to Him, and it helps me not only do the right thing, but do the right thing for the right reasons. Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God he came to earth so that it wasn't a distant decree from a cold government or a cold leader or a cold God even. Because it was God with us. It was relationship. It was community. It was connection. It was nurturing relationship. It was a healthy ecosystem. That's why when we get to the book of Hebrews, it's so cool to see that we have access to God because of this event that we are celebrating and remembering this week. Because of Jesus coming to earth and because of his life here and because he pointed the way and because of his uh, you know, sacrifice and because of his resurrection, we, we see the writer of Hebrews really go on and talk about how right now it moves from institution to relationships from, and to this healthy ecosystem. It talks about in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, that now we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. We can enter with confidence. We can go in boldly. We can have relationship with him. What I like to say is that you have refrigerator rights. You know what that means? No? That's when you can walk into somebody's house and you don't have to ask, right? You can just open their refrigerator and take something that's in it, right? Like there's certain people in your life that you kind of like, you, you welcome them at the door, you like take their coat, you like try to cater to them because they're guests in your home. And then there are other people that come in, they go right to the fridge and they're able to take like a water or whatever, right? Like those people have, refri like we have, we can boldly enter God's, you know, rel you know that relationship. Like we're, we're part of the family. We got refrigerator rights. Some of you, that's all you're going to remember out of today. I got refrigerator rights. What it describes is the access that you have to God. When you, don't have, when you don't have access to your authority or you don't have access to the lawmaker or the law enforcers and you don't have relationship, it absolutely affects the, your feelings. Not just what you do, but how you do it and why you do it. Through the person of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit, we now have access to God. And this is one of the things that hurt the Israelites in the Old Testament because their access to God was through a priest. So you go to a priest. You confess your sin. The priest and the prophet would speak to you on behalf of God or speak to God on behalf of you. So there was like this middleman. So this is why the nation was always kind of getting slightly off course. 
a little bit. Through the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we've eliminated that step. We've eliminated the middleman. We now have access to God, which means we can boldly go to him directly. We're in a relationship. And once we get that, now we really can get on track because now the things I do, it's not just out of fear or of, of punitive punishment. It's done out of love. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. We get that. We may not be happy about it, but we understand it. We may not like it all the time, but we get it. Now, in that personal relationship, it's like when dad says, go lock yourself in your room and don't come out until I say so. I don't even question. Right? I know what I'm supposed to do because I know he loves me. I know he cares for me. That he loved me first. And we have that through the person of Jesus, this irresistible leader who did not come to, to be served but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many. He, he, the, the, he didn't come to, to just unilaterally rule and reign but to have relationship with us. And when you have someone who leads and loves like Jesus that provokes you to obedience because you know it's for your good. And if we get that foundation, if we get that in place, it's going to transform your relationship with God. It will. It will transform your obedience. It will transform how, why you do things. It will transform how you think. And what it does is it builds kind of this ecosystem of your faith, something that you never graduate from. It's a principle that is so powerful that it is created to keep you in relationship, your relationship with God white hot. In fact, if you're here today and you're like, I'm starting to get a little stale in my faith. I'm not really enjoying going to church or picking up the Bible. It's just not fresh anymore. This principle, if done correctly, has kind of this built-in freshness that will enhance your relationship with God. It's better than Subway. Is that, is that the fresh? Is that the, the, they, they promote? Oh, yeah. You get it. So Hebrews chapter 11, we go from Hebrews 10 to Hebrews 11, the big faith chapter. This whole word, faith, is just everywhere in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, it starts out talking and defining faith. Because faith, when I say faith, it means different things to different people. To some, the whole belief system, they call it their faith. What I'm talking about here when I say faith is literally what is defined here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, it says this. It says, um, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen, and it gives assurance about the things we cannot see. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen, gives assurance about the things we cannot see, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's confidence. I can't see it but I believe it's there. The concept of faith that keeps me on a razor's edge of passion. It keeps me close to God because, because it means that I'm forever being taken into territory that I've never been before. It allow, I'm just not allowed to get too comfortable. Because i got to walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. No matter who you are and how many faith steps you've taken, there is something about God because, uh, because he will take you into some territory that is uncharted waters. Faith is let, letting go and trusting that what I have for you is better than what I have, what, what you have. It's letting go and trusting that what God has for you is better than what you have. And this is an immovable principle of walking with God, that if you want God to bless something in your life, you let it go. You give it to him. You want God to bless your money? Give it to him. You want God to bless your marriage? Give it to him. You want God to bless your relationships, your children, your career, your dreams? Give it to him. And he might give it back. He might give it back in a different form than you could possibly imagine. It may look nothing like it did with your imagination, with your vision, but you're trusting him and it's substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You want it in your power and not be blessed by God, then white knuckle it. Keep it close. Hold it on for dear life. And guess what? When you do that, you're going to lose it. So the concept of faith means that it's something that we never graduate from. You know, in, in our 80s, 90s, however long God keeps us uh, on this planet, gives us life, he's always like, okay, I want you to do that now. And it kind of keeps us on that edge. And this chapter is known as the faith chapter. because It's beautiful because... 
What it does is it lists all these characters that lived in different generations and at different times. And it says all these people who lived in these different generations and times had different personalities and different assignments. They all had this quality of faith. That's what kind of put them in right standing with God. And so we see this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And if you read through all of Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, it just starts out usually verse by verse by verse, by faith this person, by faith this person, and then just comes a bunch of names. Abel and Cain and Abraham and Noah and Sarah and all these people throughout the chapter. And it says, this person and this person and this person. It starts from the beginning and moves through time. And each person had a season of time. It's like a chain. And you watch the whole thing that started with God and creation. Like it says in Colossians chapter 1, which we read earlier, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. What, does not, what, what, does it, what it does theologically, it talks about the supremacy and the deity of Jesus that even though he showed up in human form between B.C. and A.D., that he was fully God, which means he was present at the beginning. So that in every link in the chain, from Adam to Abel to Noah to Abraham to Sarah and so on, everyone had their link in the chain. And guess what? You are a link in a divine chain. You are a link in a divine chain. People came before us. A lot of people did a lot of things that lead up to where we are now. And what Hebrews says is that every link in the chain, the success was not that they produced something, but by how much they lived by faith. This is a big deal about Jesus because now it's not just blind faith to a distant authority figure. It's a relationship to someone I've encountered and I've experienced and I have proximity to, which affects even my feelings, my attitudes towards obedience. All of these links in the chain have led up to where we are today. And there, there are people who have gone before us. There are people who are going to go after us. And we have our link. Now, what I like to do sometimes, and if you were here last week, you know, there's going to be parts of the message that are, are uplifting and encouraging. And there's going to be parts that are a little bit challenging. This is going to be a disturbing part for us today. Because we're talking about faith. Hebrew says, saying the quality of right standing with God is about faith. But the greatness of a person's life and link was not based on their accomplishments. It was based on their faith. What it says in Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, it says, All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. And if I read that, I don't like that, if I'm honest with you, right? I don't like that because on the surface level, if I were to read that with no encounter with God, with God myself and not to be where I'm at right now, it would really throw me off. So it may, may really kind of, you know, affect you in some way. It may throw you off because, uh, you know, I would be like, my authority, almighty God, my lawmaker, is he deceptive? Can I trust him? Because it looks like through that passage, through that verse, that he overpromised and underdelivered. Just by this verse, just by this isolated, isolated verse, people died still believing. They didn't receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance, and they agreed that they were foreigners and nomads on earth. It seems like that he promised all these good people, and it says plain as day that they did not receive what was promised. They saw it from a distance. Like in my flesh, that's hard to swallow. Because I like to see what I produce. I like to see achievement. I, see, I like to see accomplishment. I like to see it done. I like to see it in the end zone. I like to get it in the end zone. I like to spike the ball and do the touchdown dance. I want to see it done, and I want to do great things. And I don't know about you. I want my life to, you know, I want to see something come out of it. I want it to be heroic. I want to do something special. I want to change the world, and I want to see things done. I don't want to die halfway through it. I don't want to see it unfinished. But what we see here in Hebrews 11 is that the greatness is not based on what you achieve as much as what you set in motion. 
Greatness is not based on what, on what you achieve as much as what you set in motion. It extends the timeline past your lifetime. It says that there were some people that had the promise and they held on to the promise. And that promise was fulfilled and they left the world through someone else. The promise was not null and void, it says. It was not relegated to the accomplishment of an individual. It was a promise bigger than the person. It was a God-sized vision. Don't you want to live for something bigger than yourself? Some people get to see it all, that they see the fruit, that they can kind of pick, and some will not see the fruit until they're dead and gone. And that's disturbing in some way, shape, or form. You've got to change the way you see heroism and greatness from what you achieve in terms of producing to what you achieve in terms of faith and obedience. And it all kind of brings us back to this, you are a link in a divine chain. And the strength of your link is in your faith and in your obedience, not in your production. Now, if that was disturbing, just wait. Because it gets, you know, it's, it gets, some kind, it gets a little worse. At the end of Hebrews chapter 11, laying out this whole fake thing, but we're going to bring it back around. I think it's going to be powerful at the end. Talking about the strength and the link of your chain being based on faith, it says this in verse 32. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, right? The guy we've been talking about for the last five weeks. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the promise, prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned into strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back one, uh, once back again from death. He said, by faith, it's by faith that their link in the, tra- in the divine chain had tremendous victory. He mentions Gideon. We've been talking about him. He put all, puts whole armies to flight, gets the trophy, has epic stories, amazing ROI. You get to see it all happen. And that may be the story of your life. That's awesome. The story of your life may be that you step out in faith, and, and, and through that step of faith, God brings tremendous return, and you live this life, and it's abundant. Abundant. You shut the mouths of lions. But he goes on and says, but others... Verse 35, were tortured, refusing to turn to God, refusing to turn from God, rather, in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Now, I'm not sure if you had to sign up for one of those two camps. Which camp you would sign up for? Everybody who wants to shut the mouths of lions, line up over here. Everybody who wants to be sawed in half, over here. We would choose this one, right? We would choose the shut the mouths of lions one. And many, many pastors and preachers, they get up and they preach. All you have to do is have faith. And if you do that, you'll shut the mouths of lions. You'll send king to, you know, armies to flight. And you might, you might, you might. There's no limit to the power of God. But there are, there's a reality is that there are super faithful people that did not live for this world. They lived for the world beyond, and they went through tremendous oppression. And some of them died martyrs. And that's disturbing. But that's, that's what I want. I want us to see the whole picture of what he's talking about with, when it comes to living a life of faith and obedience. And we see that when it came to right standing with God, and then when it came to a life that mattered, that counted, a great life that's depicted, that's recorded in Hebrews 11. God did not value one over the other. He did not value those who put armies to flight and shut the mouths of lions and, and got the trophies versus the ones who were whipped and sawed in half and beaten and died without, you know, even though they had a good reputation, they didn't see what was promised. 
He didn't value one or the other. It wasn't, did you shut the mouths of lions or did you get sold in half? It was, how is your faith? How is your faith? And when it comes to life beyond this life, there are many who will have many accomplishments and they'll stand before God, yet when it comes to their faith, their faith may be anemic and weak. They didn't really walk by faith. They walked by sight. Everything they did was calculable. It wasn't given to God. It was in the measure of greatness in the kingdom of God is faith. And it started with this act of Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be clung to. But he gave up his divine privileges, it says in Philippians. This amazing leader, this Savior who did something divine, created a way for us to be saved and then communes with us and lives inside of us and now calls us to live by faith and the results all go to him. I think Palm Sunday... This was weighing heavy on Jesus' mind. This was Jesus' Hebrews 11 moment. This is the second camp. He lived in the miracle working and the, the crowds and the cheers. And Palm Sunday was this camp over here. Like he was living in the reality of the, of the camp of you know, the victorious Jesus. And he was living in But he was also thinking about I'm about to, to go through some things this week. I'm about to go through some struggles. His disciples didn't know it. I mean, if you read before the triumphal entry, you see that Jesus was predicting his own death, right? He knew it was coming. We see him go through this, this Passover week. We see him teaching his disciples, trying to let, download everything to them in the last possible moment that he could. We see him going to the Garden of Gethsemane. We see him, you know, sweating drops of blood, being so stressed out because he knew the weight that was on him. He knew that there was this camp he was experiencing, but he was also experiencing that he was going to be beaten. He was going to be tortured. He was going to be crucified. He was going to die for us to have access and right relationship with God. And I think it's this per per perfect model of living by faith. And walking by faith, no matter if you're getting cheered, like you're a celebrity going through the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, or you're going through the pain that he's going to endure in the days to come. He didn't uh, consider equality with God something to be grasped. He gave it up. He took the life of a servant. It was his kingdom advancement moment. And that's why we can, he can relate to you no matter which camp you're in. No matter if you're in a, a faith step where you're just having incredible victory or you're walking by faith and you just feel like you're just dealing, you just get hit constantly, an oppression. Jesus can relate to you no matter where you're at. No matter which circumstances you find yourself in at the moment, he's been there. You are a link in a divine chain. Many came before, many will come after. We have our time right now. And there's going to be a day. There's going to be a day that no one in this room <laughs> may be alive. There will be a day that our season ends. Some of us may live to an old age. Some of us may die young. Some of us may accumulate great wealth. Some of us may die destitute. Some of us may accomplish a lot and be famous. And some may be more anonymous. Some of our stories will be told by others. And some of our stories won't be told by anyone. That's not what makes you great. That's not what makes you a hero. And that's not what God expects of you. That's not what he's looking for in you. What he's looking for, what your authority figure, what your loving father, who is not a distant God throwing rules on you, who is trustworthy, and he says, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you can do great things. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I want to commune with you, he says. And even if you're destitute, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But what I ask you to do is to live a life of faith because without faith, it's impossible to please me and I want to be with you. We have this link. Right now. This is our time. And it's fleeting. That's why kingdom builders are so important. It's not a moment. It's a movement. It's about us doing things and accomplishing things and putting you know, our resources to things that's going to, be, that's going to outlive us. Jesus says, 
in, in Acts, right? He says you're going to be witnesses. You're going to be, you're going to do all that. This is going to be an epic story from you. You've got to move from where you are outward. This is the God-sized vision. Our job is not coming up with something other than that. It's not to recreate something other than that. It's not to have sideways energy. We can just we get into his flow. What are you wanting me to do? What's my obedience step? What's my step of faith? What's, I'm just that link in the chain. Because at the end of the day, we are not vision creators. We are vision conduits. We're not vision creators. We're vision conduits. We're not trying to create a vision board of what our life is supposed to be like. We're supposed to say, God, what's your vision? Let me keep in step with your spirit. We're conduits of a God-sized vision, real clear. And it will keep you from getting too big on yourself, buying too too much into your own press, because it's not your job to come up with a new vision. It's your job to get in sync, to get aligned with the vision of God. It's my, my job to get in line with the vision of God. So there's some components real quickly I'm going to go through to this vision, to visionary faith. One thing is this. You've got to seek them. We see it all over Scripture. Jeremiah, if you seek me with your whole, your whole heart, you'll find me. You've got to seek him. Before you can see anything, before you, whatever, before you have this vision, you have to seek him. Hebrews 11.6, he rewards those who diligently seeks him. Jesus said, ask, you'll receive. Seek, and you will find, right? For some reason, God gets something out of our persistent seeking of him. When we seek him, he responds to that. So the first part of vision is seeking. And if you take the time out, instead of giving God your plans to seek his plans, God will begin to reveal to you those things. Seek him. The second one is see. If you seek God, you'll find him. And when you see the vision of God, it's daunting. It's daunting. It is daunting. Why? Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Seeing God's vision unfold is eye-opening. So you seek him, you see him, and then you have to trust. You got to trust him. This is the part that a lot of us have, you know, we, we, you know just, it's hard for us. We can seek him. Okay, God, that's great. I see, I see what you want to do. Great. Now I got to trust you. Uh-oh. Because trust is a scorecard. Is belief that God can and will do what he says he will do. And in our head, in our logic, we agree with that statement. But sometimes it really gets called into account. It's challenging when we actually apply that to our lives. Trusting God means exchanging our plans and dreams for his and letting him lead. And then the last thing is go. Go and make disciples. Go and, go and do this. You seek him. You see him. You trust him. Now it's time to go. It's time to go. Ever see that guy or girl working out and you catch them looking at the mirror? Looking at themselves in the mirror? Like posing? You don't have to go to the gym for that. You just like get on Instagram. You can see it. Muscles aren't for show. They're for go. Right? Like, there's nothing about posing that's going to help you. Like, they're, they're for doing stuff. Muscles are for doing stuff. When you think about the kingdom of God, the muscles of the body of Christ aren't for showing. They're not for posing. They're for, they're, they're, they're for going. We're not trying to grow, uh, to grow the church bigger so we can put on a bigger show. We're not trying to grow the church bigger so we can say, look how big our building is. Look how bright our, bright our lights are. We're not posing. Our muscles are for going. It's for work. We have bigger muscles so we can do more work. That's what Kingdom Builders is all about. It's not merely a talk series. It's not a department. It's not a mindset that permeates. It's a mindset that permeates everything that we do. Absolutely everything. From a light bulb to a water well to a bakery. It's a link in a divine chain. God involves us in his mission. It's his vision. It's God's vision. Not because he needs us, but because he loves us. It isn't our vision, it's his. And our job is to step out in faith and be obedient. That's what it takes to be a hero. And the macro view of the world of eternity is so much bigger than us. But let's not underestimate our opportunity right now to do what God has given us, to do the right thing for the right reasons. Reasons. He's given us breath. He's given us influence. He's put us in this city. He's put you where you're located. We have all this stuff going on. It's our time. Let's make the link strong with obedience, strong by walking by faith and not by sight, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God, I give you what I can't see. I give you what I have for what I can't see because I trust you.
That should be our mentality. Amen? Let me pray for you this morning. Father, thank you so much for this chapter in Hebrews that just lists out all the different heroes of faith as an example of what you are looking for. That it wasn't just about great achievements and great accomplishments. And yes, God, we want to see those things, but God, it's really about our heart and about our faith. And God, I just pray right now that as we look at faith, as we look at looking to, to your vision, your God-sized vision, that we will start to seek that. Seek you with all of our heart. And when we seek you with all, you've promised that we will find you. And that when we seek you, that you'll start revealing things to us, that we'll be able to see your God-sized vision, and be able to keep in step with that, get in step with that vision, align ourselves, and then trust you along the way. Give the things that you've given to us back to you, because we know that through you, all things are possible. Through you, if we want to be blessed, we need to give it to you, God. To trust you. And then, because we're getting stronger in our faith, because we're getting stronger in our relationship, because we can boldly access you, and we can, we can commune with you, and we're stronger in our faith, that we can go. And we can do some awesome things in your name. And that the muscles that we're developing in our faith, can lead us to go do some incredible things. God, I pray for those who are experiencing seasons of great victory, that they can use that to bring encouragement and joy and, and, and just coming alongside others and just and use that for great for the kingdom of God. And those who are, are experiencing oppression uh, will understand that they're not being oppressed just to be oppressed, but that they just need to continue to walk by faith. And that, God, you value faith first. And our heart first. It's not what we accomplish. Greatness is not measured by what we accomplish or what we achieve or what we accrue. It's by our heart and our, what we set in motion and our obedience and our faith. God, as we walk out of here today, recognizing that you can relate to both the celebratory victor, uh, the victory of, the, of, of, a, of a triumphal entry, but also understanding that you're about to go through tremendous pain and hurt and oppression for the sake and for the reason that now we can have right relationship with you, that we can have access to the Father, and changes our whole ecosystem of understanding who you are, what you have for us and how we can relate with you. God, I pray that that just deep gets, gets us deep in our heart and our soul, and we can apply it to our lives, that we can walk out of here full of faith, full of purpose, and living out a God-sized vision. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.